David Sproxton. I'm the co-founder with Peter Lord of Aardman Animations. We've been running for almost 42 years now, which is no mean feat these days for an independent production company. Well, Early Man is really a kind of underdog, I suppose you really call it an underdog sports movie, and that's what Nick's called it. Uh, it's an underdog movie, that's for sure. It's about two different cultures clashing, um, the, the, the caveman tribe, and uh, who run into, in a rather violent way, the uh, Bronze Age. Um, and it's about conflict resolution, really, through sport, I suppose, is the big underlying theme. Um, it was an idea that Nick had actually quite a long time ago, so many years ago, you know, the origins of sport and the origins of football and at what point did cavemen stop clubbing each other to death as a way of conflict re re resolution, at what point they realised there's got to be a better way and actually how did, how did football start anyway? So all that stuff kind of got in his head. He's not a football fan, funnily enough. He, he doesn't really follow football at all. Um, and that, that idea, we, you kind of see in the prologue of the film and then the rest of the story kind of plays out uh, with Doug and Hobnob and the others. Well, I think on, on Curse of the Were Rabbit, he had a co-director with Steve Box. And again, you did have some supervising animators, Lloyd Price and others, to kind of relay Nick's desires and wants. Nick always does what we call labs, live action video. Perform, so he performs in front of a video camera, the, the parts, how he sees them in his head. So he acts them out to give the animators um, a reference, not to be slavishly copied, but just an idea of what's in his head. And I think also from Nick's point of view, it's a way of him getting to grips with, with, the, with the characters and actually how they're going to interact. And clearly he's got in his head the physical comedy that he wants to put on screen, so he'll act that out as well. And the animation supervisors, in this case, will... Beecher and Merlin Crossing, they did that work as well, kind of with Nick. But Nick decided on this one, he wanted to just direct the film himself without a co-director partner. And of course, it's a huge workload, particularly in editorial, because you're editing, and you're still writing bits of story as you go along, so there's a lot to take on board. So this time, he kind of wasn't on the floor a great deal. He left that pretty much to Will and Merlin, and spent a lot more time in, in edit, actually wrestling with the films that was coming through and also wrestling with story changes that we were making towards the end of the film. It's interesting because if you roll the clock back and looked at Chicken Run, which had, well, had, had quite a big scale to it as well, um, we had you know, big scenic backgrounds, you know, painted, hand-painted, they were 20, 30 feet across. Um, and we worked in two scales. We had, you know, most of the chickens were about this big and they had long shot chickens for the scenes of all the huts and particularly when they're interacting with the humans. I think if we did it now, we'd probably do more CGI on that film. Um, so what you're looking at is what have you got, what are the tools in the toolbox that can help you get on screen what you want to get on screen and make it a cinematic experience. And then, okay, let's kind of do the shot breakdown. How are you actually going to achieve this shot? Well, if we're doing, say, blue screen skies for that shot, we may as well do it for the whole sequence. Um, it also means things like how much space, how much physical space have we got to lay out the sets? How big is this set going to be? Is there a way in which actually we could save space and do set extensions? I mean, the, the thing here, the big thing here was the arena at the end with its theoretical like 30,000 spectators. We knew very early on we're going to have to do those CGI. So quite a lot of work went into the design of the physical arena. We built the first tier of, of seats um, and then the other two tiers are CGI. And in fact, the three or four tiers came about because quite early on Nick wanted that very funny gag of Doug tumbling through all the seats and going through kind of tier after tier and realised, oh my god, to get that you're going to, playing that classic repeat action gag, it means we've got about three or four tiers of seats which means the arena's going to be really big <laughs> so we're going to have to do it kind of CGI. And then there are things like you know, distant extra the football scenes at the end, some of those characters are CG the long shots are CG most all the all the core action is is stop frame action. So there's very little, if almost non uh, core uh, hero activity, which is done in CG. All the close ups, all the mid shots, are all puppetry. And it's slightly, slightly horses for courses whether or not we build a set. I mean, most of the sets again are physical. We built most of them. Most of the skies we uh, put in as a composite, simply because. We wanted mood changes over the skies, and that would require an awful lot of scenic art. We still have to do the scenic art, but you can do it on a smaller scale. And of course, it means you can grade it to match later. Uh, you can sort of dial in how much, you know, 
the, the, the certain amount of green in some of the skies, kind of reflecting the pollution, the polluting nature of the Bronze Age city, that kind of idea. But rather than lock ourselves in with a with a, um, a scenic painting on a big canvas, we said actually we'll do this. We can put this in post. Gave us more flexibility. And these days, I mean, we used to work out, oh, you know, it's going to be 1,500 shots. I reckon uh, five, 600 of them will have sort of CG elements in them. We now say, actually, let's imagine almost every shot will have something in it. It might just be taking out support rigs. Uh, there'll be some digital element in the shot. So we kind of roughly pan for, let's imagine every shot has something, and hopefully we'll have some change to take home later. Um, because you just learn that as the thing progresses, you're going to add elements. Um, and it might, it might not be all the shots, but there might be something within that sequence which is going to have to be done, CG. It is, you know, it's a great toolkit we've got. And even, you know, they were shooting stop frame in its traditional way, you know, we can now have a lot more support rigs. So you can be more ambitious with the actions, with the puppet action. You can get them to leap up in the air. You can do a lot more flamboyant stuff because you can put these rigs in and then you take them out in post. So that gives the animator actually a lot more freedom and a lot more expression for the characters. And the pipeline, of course, so that's entirely digital. You know, we're shooting on digital uh, SLRs. Um, we have huge files. We shoot kind of raw files and then they get compressed. But the actual the tool that the um, animators use is, is Dragon Frame, and that's an incredibly sophisticated animator's workstation now. It, it gives, you know, we can put in the animatic in there, we can put in the, the you know, the, um, um, the outgoing shot and the incoming shot, so you can see, you know, the animator can see how that fits. You can put in the dialogue, you can put in all your lighting states, so if the lighting's changing during the shot, that's pre programmed. So it's an amazing, you know, the, the digital world has enabled us to do very traditional type work in a very sophisticated way. It, it's brilliant, actually, it's fantastic. I think if you use the analogy of a kind of concert pianist, a lot of people that can play the piano, there are not that many great concert pianists. So, and to be a great concert pianist, it takes two things, a certain amount of innate talent and a lot of practice. Uh, and I think what we found is that a lot of the, you know, the film schools, the animation schools, uh, they don't necessarily focus on the performance side of animation, what you're actually acting, you know, what Ed Hooks teaches at FMX, for example. Um, and a number of reasons I think it takes time, like, you know, if you're going to be a concert pianist, you're going to rehearse, you know, five, six hours a day at least, five, six days a week, you know, for several years to get absolutely up to that level. Um, and so we actually run a three-month animation, intensive animation, character animation course for both stop frame and CG. And it's a fairly simple process in many ways. It's a series of exercises which get progressively harder, but you're just practicing for, for three months solidly um, with master classes. And that's what we found, actually. You can, if you, you find people with a, a reasonable amount of talent and a passion for it, you can actually make them better and better. And of course, we still have a lot of the animators that we trained pre-Chicken Run. We did two six-month courses way back uh, in a similar vein in the run-up to Chicken Run, and that produced actually about a dozen pretty good quality animators. And of course, they'd done Chicken Run, they'd done Curse of the Were Rabbit, a load of commercial work, so they've, they've had a lot of practice. Um, this last year, we've had, what, Leica shooting stuff, we've been shooting stuff, you know, Isle of Dogs in London been shooting. There's been a lot, of, a lot of demand for stop frame animators. And in a sense, there aren't, as you say, there are not that many great ones around. Um, and we're having to generate some more. And it goes in waves, you know, currently, well, we've just finished shooting, Isle of Dogs has finished, Leica's finished. So at the moment, they're kind of all wondering what to do next. But you can, you can, you know, it's a craft. It is definitely a craft, like acting in a sense. The best ones have, an acting sensibility, and that's what we kind of hone for them. Okay, you, you have an acting sensibility, you've got to impart that into this little stop frame puppet. So how do you do that? And we, we, you can teach them. And I think it's more akin, well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's more akin to an acting performance in, the, in conventional animation, whether it's 2D, classical 2D animation, or even CGI, you can put your key positions in you know, frame one, frame 12, frame 24, whatever, 36, and you can go back and kind of fill them in. And stop frame, you, you, you can't do that. We're shooting kind of linearly. We'll block out the, you know, the, the move to make sure it kind of fits within the, you know, the, the shot length. But actually, it's a linear performance. You go from frame one to frame 100 in a linear way. So that, I think, is a difference. What's interesting, I think, is that when we, when we did Flushed Away, we trained a lot of our 
a number of our stop frame animators in CGI. And they became very good CGI animators because they naturally had this understanding of 3D space, weight and the hips and everything, and had been trained in you know, linear progressive animation. So they actually, they actually took to it like a duck to water. And obviously some of them stayed doing CGI. A lot of them said, I want to go, I, I love doing stop frames, so I'll go back to doing that. And I would say it was absolutely right. Every film we've made, you hit, you hit a moment, how that, you know, which is mostly a story moment. You know, our, well, there seems to be a, a, a kind, of, kind of conflict that we don't see. I don't know how we're going to resolve this. Well, if they're doing that, how the hell are they going to do this later? You hope you've resolved a lot of those in the writing and the animatic stage. But there were times, and it happened a little bit on Early Man, actually. You know, we knew, I'd, I'd actually said, we said jokingly to each other, now the football scene's going to be really complex to shoot. We sh we, can we shoot that first? And of course, you never do, because you kind of shoot it broadly, chronologically. Oh, it'd be fine, it's, it's a football match. But actually, the detail of landing that match, the actual logistics, how are they going to play, and how do we convince the audience that they've actually upped their skills at such a level they can beat, beat the, uh, the Bronzio team, um, was left a little bit late, to be honest. And, they, and so we spent quite a lot of time in the middle of production, actually working out the, the, the choreography of that last, that last act. Um, and that's what I would say. You tend to, the things you stumble on or stumble onto, or the things that make you stumble, <laughs> are story, uh, story moments more than practical moments. Sometimes, you know, you'll have a, how the hell are we gonna, how are we gonna get that on screen? Well, th there'll be a solution. We'll find a solution, whether it's a, an in-camera solution or a, C a CGI solution. So the things that we keep us awake at night are actually story, story problems more than anything. Yeah, I, the funding situation is, is changing greatly. When we set about doing the first Sean movie, we'd finished the, the Sony relationship had come to an end. You know, our feature films have broadly been, in a way, the Hollywood model. We've made them in the UK, but they've been funded and marketed by either DreamWorks or Sony. Um, and we kind of were going to almost default back to the classic British independent production company. Uh, whereby you gather the money from a number of different people, possibly you know, a dozen or more different funders, and it's a real jigsaw. And we thought, oh my God, that's going to be tricky because you're then answering to a lot of different people and who's going to market it, who's going to get it out there, we're going to have a lot of sub-agents all, all over the world. And uh, we were very pleased, actually, when we started having conversations with, with Studio Canal. You know, they're now part of Vivendi, so it's a bigger... They've got a quite a big vision about their, their film output and their distribution. Um, but I think we're now in a situation, as you say, where there are other players in the mix, and it is sort of disrupting certainly that conventional, you know, theatrical release onto TV and what used to be kind of DVDs and stuff. And certainly in the other areas that we work, which is the TV, the kids series, say, or the family, family program for, for what we call broadcast with a small b, we are beginning to talk to you know, the Netflixes, the Amazons, and, and the Googles, and the Apples of the world. Um, they use what they call them, they call them fangs, don't they? Was it Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google? Uh, they've clearly got a lot of money to play with. Uh, they're trying to be, I don't know whether they're consciously being disruptive rather than saying, actually, we, we know how to reach audiences and we got audiences literally by the billion. There's a way they, they've managed to do that with all their stuff, all their social media side. They have access to literally billions of people. So they can get, for want of a better word, content to them very, very easily. And I think, you know, if you look at, it's interesting, if you look at the numbers, you know, we talk about box office success, and it's, you know, if you're lucky, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. What it represents in eyeball is actually not that huge compared to, say, what used to be conventional television or Facebook numbers or Apple numbers. Um, so you've got these sort of they're sort of hidden giants at the moment, aren't they? They're massive companies that can reach massive numbers of people. And, as, and they're moving into, you know, film content distribution. And it will have a massive impact. Now, the big question is, how long will it last? Uh, will they be good curators of content? Will they be able to channel their, their masses of numbers into the stuff that people want to see and watch? My feeling is it will default back to a sort of rather more normative thing, where they, where they will be like the old broadcasters, where, the, you, where you'll have, like the BBC or CBS or whoever they are, they have a certain brand of programming and people go to it because it's trusted programming and they enjoy it and they know their audience. You know, whether you'll, 
the, the Apples and the Googles will, will have, as it were, segments. Obviously, they will do it for sport, or they might do it for fishing, or they might do it for car racing to reach their audiences. And probably five or six years' time, it'll have settled down a bit more. Oh, Apple are great at doing you know, really quirky, weird stuff over here, and Google are doing this other kind of stuff over here. And they'll, they'll have marked out their, their brands a bit more, I think. Um, at the moment, it's all up for grabs. There's a lot of money being thrown, thrown at the wall. Um, sometimes I think probably too much. Um, they may or may not, not know what they're doing. They've been buying in, you know, top commissioning talent from the con more conventional areas to help drive their, their kind of content streams. Um, at the moment, it's great for people like us because there's more money available to try and do different kind of stuff. Um, and at some point, you know, say in a few years' time, it'll have settled. Um, I think... You know, the big studios, I think they're going to have a hard time because relatively their numbers theatrically are, are relatively small compared to the reach of these, of these fangs. Um, and whether they will change their marketing model or their ownership or how they distribute or how they bring their people into, into cinemas um, is going to be interesting to see. Because I think what we're seeing now at cinema is we're seeing the big blockbusters having big success. You know, there's a sort of... And then the very low budget almost art house films, which can pay their way on maybe maybe up to sort of $20 million budgets, quite small budgets, maybe a little bit more than that, can have some success in the, in the, in the, using the conventional theatrical distribution model. I think those films that are sort of in the midway, you know, between 35 and what, $85 million, say, that middle ground has kind of, been, kind of disappeared. Um, so it's either big blockbuster costing, you know, $200 million or whatever, or it's a $20 million thing at the bottom. And it's interesting, Three Billboards has had great success on the back of the Oscars, very low-budget film. Shape of Water, what was that, $20 million? Uh, beautiful low-budget film, has had moderate success, and actually will pay its way, which is great. Um, or else it's the big, you know, superhero stuff. And the middle ground seems to have really, I think, people are saying, I'll watch it on Netflix in a couple of months' time and I can pay $10 a month to do that have that choice. Um, so I think that's, that's going to be interesting to see, see what happens uh, in the theatrical market over the next few years as they kind of wrestle with these new players.